question to pose to you guys. Who are the voices that you listen to? Perhaps your parents, your husband, spouse, friends, family. You know, those voices are very important. So we need to listen to them because that's part of our inner circle. The voices that I've listened to when I was a teen have changed my life. Although the voices weren't always positive, there is a happy ending. When I was younger, I wanted to be a police detective. I would watch Cagney and Lacey. I just knew that's what I wanted to do. I just knew I could learn how to run down the street, the slacks and the high heels with the ugly blouses with the bows and f climb fences and fly over cars. I knew I could do that. I would ride around the neighborhood on my 10 speed. Now I just got a bicycle upgrade. So I knew I could go fast and faster and catch everyone. I even went as far as to build a detective kit. I would take paper, empty paper towel rolls and I would paint them black and I would look all around the neighborhood as if they were real binoculars. Mm -hmm. I would carry around a three by five tablet and the pencil I stole from the bowling alley, but just don't tell them I stole it. And I would write down all the suspicious activity in the neighborhood. I had loads of stuff, especially from my neighbors and all the businesses around. And especially those two guys that had the VW van shop. It was an auto, auto body shop and they repaired VW vans. There was something crazy about them. They had that long hippie hair and I didn't get it. And they always looked like they were busy, but no, I would spy on them all the time. It was a different van in there every day and they really didn't work. At least I didn't think so. So one day I was going around town, got really busy taking down license plate. It was, it was a busy day. I didn't happen to catch the time and I said, oh man, I gotta get home, I gotta hurry. Raced home, threw my, my evidence book on the table. I said, I'll be all right there just for a moment. Zipped my bike into the backyard, ran into the kitchen because it was my turn to throw in the Swanson TV dinners into the oven. I turned around, came back in to grab my evidence book because you know it's confidential. And my dad had it. He picked it up and he was looking at it. And I could hear the pages flipping. And he said, what is this? What are you doing? And I froze and I, and I didn't know how to respond. And he's like, what are you doing with this? You don't have anything else better to do? And I, I just froze. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed. Don't you know women are not police officers? Somehow that didn't compute with me. You know, always a little bit of a rebel that I am. And he said, you need to do something else because women aren't police officers. Stop being foolish. And so, you know, we, we ate. I wasn't really hungry and he yelled at me for that too. But who wants really a TV dinner? So I sat in my room later that night and thought about it. I said, have I seen any female police officers? Not in my neighborhood. It, maybe he's true. M maybe what he says, all his voices to me, that Cagney and Lacey is just a fictionary um, part of my story, just something that I imagine that I, I could be. But I had to come to the realization that maybe he was right. He must be right. That's my father. So I can't become a police officer. That's the voice he left me with. So I had to figure out what I was going to do next. So I said, I got it. I got this handled. I'm going to become a doctor. I'm going to change the world. I'll fix everything and everybody. I'll cure everything. And I said, well, who do I know? I don't know any doctors, but I, maybe, maybe I can find someone who can lead me in that direction. And I thought about it. My mother's auntie was a nurse. I said, she'll have the answers. 
So I got, got on the bus. I had to take two buses this time because she moved from our house that was near mine to a senior park. Now, I really never knew. I thought she was maybe mid-50s, early 60s. Never knew how old she was, but she had white hair her entire life, or my entire life at least. And so you know, I made arrangements to go talk to her. I arrived, and much to my surprise, she had a big, tall glass of milk and cookies on the table. You now She's a, a very lovely homemaker, had two kids, two daughters, married her whole life. Um, one, one daughter happened to be a nurse, the other, doctor, uh, the other daughter uh, a homemaker. So I'm sitting enjoying cookies and milk. Who, who doesn't like cookies and milk? And I said, Auntie, I made a life decision. And she's like, okay, honey, what is it? I said, I'm gonna become a doctor. Then everything became silent and she broke out into laughter. She was laughing so hard that her hands covered the flower that she had sewn on her hand, hand knit dress. And I was trying to figure out what was funny about that. So I was quiet and quiet and I, I, I said, I don't understand. And she said, I need to go help your father. Because obviously, you know, him being a single dad and everything, he, maybe he's teaching you the wrong thing. I said, hmm. Okay, sure. But she, well, let's address your, your doctor destiny. And I said, okay. She's like, when are you going to come to the reality that girls don't become doctors? You can, in our family, we become nurses and homemakers. And I said, oh. But she said, you, you can't have both. Once you become a homemaker, you have to stay home with the children and tend to all your husband's needs. So you can't do both. And I said, oh. Riding home on the bus really sucked that night because I, I couldn't figure out, well, one, why can't I have both? Two, is she right? Now, I haven't seen a female doctor in my town, nor have I ever been treated by one. So her voice must be right. Women cannot become doctors. What will I do? So in alignment with my family's wishes, my, my father was not a, a proponent of women going to college. So I, I bowed out. I became a homemaker. So at, by the age of 21, I'd been married for a while and had three children. Family was happy. But I thought I could offer the world a lot more, but just didn't know how to do that. My husband got the great idea we should go, he should find me a women's group in, in the church that will keep me occupied. So we did, we, we found a church and it was lovely. I didn't quite match with how everybody else was because I, I grew up in a different type of church. But it, it was amusing, it was spirit filled, lots of music. I was intrigued. And then the pastor introduced himself, very lovely man, and his wife. And I said, oh, I don't think I've ever experienced that before. I grew up in church. <coughs> the only reason I knew my childhood pastor's name is because we used to make fun of him in Sunday school because he had a girl's first name. And so I was amused at the, the pastor now, now that I'm a young teenager, young woman, would get to know me, would take time to get to know me. I found that fascinating. They were the nicest people. I distinctly remember the summer of 1994. My kids were up there in the choir singing. And I sat back in the back, trying to get some quiet time. I was probably trying to take a nap, but we won't tell anybody. So I see the pastor walking up the aisle. And he said, my child, you're going to be a doctor. And I thought, oh, he's talking to one of the kids. And he said, my child, you're going to be a doctor. And I look, and I look. I said, 
He must be talking to himself. You know, he's, he's getting older. And then he came up close to me. He said, my child, you're going to be a doctor. I said, who are you talking to? I'm married with three kids. Life is over. So he, can, he stopped and just looked at me. He just stared. Seemed like hours. And I know it was only a few minutes, but it was an awkward situation. So my story is it was hours. And then he came up and he gave me this hug. A hug that I've never quite had before. Now he being a big man, over six foot, over 300 pounds, I got lost in his embrace for just a moment. And as he started to let me go, he said, I want you to follow your dreams. Do not dim your light for anyone. Well, being 21, what does that mean? I wasn't sure, so I had to think about it and think about it. I said, God must have sent him to send me a message. But I didn't know what that was. So weeks and months went by. I said, I think I need to start the process. So I had enrolled in college. Now, we didn't tell anybody. I hid my books at my friend's house. I actually kept some at my elementary school and volunteered a little more than what I should have but under the covering, I was writing papers. I would bring my kids to my friend Peggy's house and drop them off in the morning, and she would sneak them to school for me. Okay, they, she did a wonderful job at doing that, and I thank her for the opportunity, but I got to sneak away and go to college. Okay, it was one class at a time, but the, I had the rest of my life, and I, I lived in fear that they would find out. And yes, eventually they found out, and the voices were awful. They were loud, they were condescending. They told me I was gonna fail, that I was gonna embarrass the family. Okay, I could take it. Well, soon graduation came, came along. Did they attend? No, and that was okay. Did I attend? No, but that was okay too because they could never take that away from me. My point is that the voices in your circle are very important. They can make or break you. They can also speak life into you. Now, let, let's, let's talk about inner circles and, and bring it way back in history. Well, let's take one of the oldest books, the Bible, just humor me, just for a moment. Everybody has heard about David, the shepherd boy that was out in the fields. He sat and he prepared himself, as was told to us in Second Chronicles, how he spent a majority of his lifetime preparing to be king. But he didn't know he was going to be king. He just wanted to create a healthy inner circle of, of warriors and men that had many talents of loyalty and motivation and respect, and people who wanted to be with him and near him. So I can trace inner um, voices and inner circles as far back as, as the Bible. Now, my, my friend and mentor, John Maxwell, we were actually talking about this story at a conference, and he told me a person's potential is determined by those who are closest to them. So he was asking me who was, what qualities should we look for for people in our inner circle or what voices? And he was telling me, he looks for, do they, are they of influence to others? What do they bring to the table? Do they hold a valued position in their family or their business? Do they value you? Do they give you a positive are they positively impactive of others? So do, are they positive? Are they, do they, are they helpful? Are they loyal? Then he told me about a story about President Ronald Reagan and Billy Graham. 
I tried to fool around and say I didn't know who those people were. I wasn't old enough, but he didn't buy it. But I was trying to figure out how he would weave those two together. And he said, these are two men that relied on their inner circle, on the voices that they had built up. And without that inner circle, they wouldn't have been able to do the jobs that they were set out to do because, of course, we all know their jobs were massive. Mother Teresa once said, you can do what I cannot. I can do what you cannot. Together, we can do great things. This is the magnitude of the law of the inner circle. Every leader needs a team. John Rahm says, we become the combined average of the five people we hang out with. That's kind of scary. Have you thought about the five people you hang out with recently? Maybe I need to change my friend group. But who's your favorite five? So I wrote down a list of things I look for. A, a creative spirit, someone that can see a big, the big picture, a motivator, a critical thinker, and someone that's honest. So let me explore that a little bit more. A creator. I need someone who will help me develop my dreams and see it out. A big picture thinker, someone that can channel into that vision and make sure that, you know, we stay on that correct path. A motivator, you know, sometimes I need to be inspired just to keep going because sometimes it's, it's just baby steps. A critical thinker, okay, devil's advocate, to tell me to, to be the one that makes the pros and the con lists and then to tell me, where I messed up, and honesty, and someone who has a good heart. I think that falls into one category because we all want to be honest and put the best face forward. You want people to believe in you and thrust you forward and towards your dreams. So surround and collaborate with the right people who truly value you and are committed to help you grow personally and professionally. As far as my story goes, let me tell you, I'm, I'm standing here with over a dozen certificates, an AA degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and two years ago, I got my doctorate. Okay, maybe one class at a time, but I did it. So your takeaway, choose the voices you listen to wisely. Your future depends on it. Thank you.